Good morning, church. How are we doing this morning? Is there anybody excited to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Well, if you're excited to be in the house, can you stand to your feet if you're willing and if you're able? This is the day that the Lord has made. We ought to rejoice and be glad in it. This weekend, we're starting a new series, and so we thought it'd be fitting to start this service off by reading a scripture together that I believe is going to tie into the text today. And let, let's read this together. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 through 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Amen and amen. The beautiful thing, yeah, yeah, amen. The beautiful thing about this Christian walk is all of us, we may be in different seasons of our life, but we are all running the race. And, and the beautiful thing I love about scripture is uh, there's a verse that says, the race isn't given to the swift nor to the strong, but to him that endured to the very end. And so the question is, how do we endure this race to the very end? The way that we can endure is by putting our full trust, our whole dependence on God. It's not up to us. It's all on him. So this morning, we want to saturate this place with worship and saturate this place with surrender and say, God, we need you. We want you. And you you're all that we need and all that we want. So we're going to sing this chorus together to start our service together that simply says, Oh God, my God, I need you. So let's sing it together, church. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages. I'm standing on your faithfulness, on your faithfulness. Come on, sing it. Oh, God. Oh, God. How I need you. How I need you. Oh, rock of ages. Oh, rock, oh, rock of ages. Make that your declaration. Oh God, oh God, my God, I need you. You say, Oh God, my God, I need you. Every hour of the day, now I need every you. moment, every season, oh rock of faithfulness. So let's give him praise. Come on, come on. Let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your name.
sea. Let faith be the song that calms the storm inside of me. Let it rise. Let faith arise. Let it rise. We'll see you break down. posture of praise and worship this morning and let's just lift this up together so I throw up my hands and praise you again and again church so I one response. I've got one response. I've got one response. 
got just one move. I've got just one move. With my arms stretch wide. Father, we give you our highest praise this morning, which is our hallelujah. We thank you so much for all that you've done for us, for waking us up this morning, for starting us on our way, for breathing breath into our lives, for getting us new mercies that we don't deserve, Father, but we are so grateful for you. So we throw up our hands to sing hallelujah to you because you're worthy and you're deserving of this praise, Father. As the service continues this morning, God, I pray the work that you've begun in our hearts, you will complete that great work, Father, that you would just continue to just keep working on us, Lord, as we strive for the mark and the perfection of your faith. So, God, we give you praise, we give you honor, we give you glory, and it's in your precious Son, Jesus' name we pray. Let all God's people say amen. Say amen one more time. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. Thank you, Kristen. You may be seated, Grow family. Well, thankful that you could join us today uh, here at the Grove. Been interested to see what services people come to as we've started new services. We had like 700 people come to the 8 a.m. and ran out of burritos and all that. That's great. And uh, so this may be the 1115 crowd. So uh, thankful that this is a service that you've chosen to be a part of. Um, we're thankful for all that God is doing uh, here at the Grove. Anything that's good's happening, it's all because of, of him. Uh, last weekend uh, at Easter, we had 105 people stand and accept Christ in our services, so we praise the Lord for that, people who gave their life to the Lord. Um, 
By the way, if you're new, my name is Daniel, and this is my wife. <laughs> I'm Natalie. <laughs> Welcome to the Grove. Welcome to the Grove. All right. Well, fantastic. Well, um, so we're excited about what the Lord is is doing. We have uh, 70 people getting baptized this weekend. So those are you may have seen some of them over there as as you were walking in. And I just ran over from the membership class. We're doing a membership class right now. So during the last song, they're like, get over there. So I ran over here. You're making me a little nervous. I was like, I guess I'm going to do this on my own. And I was like, where's Daniel? But you made it. I uh, made it just in time. So excited for all the Lord's doing. So for those of you who are new, tell us what they need to know. Yes, if you are new, welcome to The Grove. We're so glad that you could join us. We truly are a family, and we would love to get to know you. So if you could, please kindly fill out the Connect card. It's on the inside of your bulletin, and place that on in one of the offering bins as you exit. Um, but we would also love to meet you in person and answer any questions you might have. So after service, we want to invite you over to Guest Central, which is over to my left on your right. And that way we can just get to know you and, yeah, like I said, answer any questions you have about our church. So, Right on. Uh, well, in just a second, Pastor Damon Horton's going to come up and he's going to preach God's word. Maybe last weekend was your first time here coming to the Grove and you saw me preach. I think it's, it's good for you to know here at the Grove. I don't preach every single weekend. And all God's people said, amen. <laughs> you know? uh, we, we believe in, in team leadership. Uh, so we have uh, other people preach as well. I, I teach about 30 times a year. If you didn't know that, that's like my goal, 30 times. And we divide up amongst other people. Damon serves on our staff as an associate pastor, but works full time uh, as the director of intercultural studies at CBU. And we're blessed by his teaching and faithfulness. So before Damon comes up, uh, we wanted to take a moment just to even honor uh, Tom and Carol Lance. Uh, this weekend, they're celebrating 50 years of marriage. So would you welcome them as, as they come up? Look at that cute picture of them Aww. up there, huh? <laughs> I love it. Well, we love you, Tom and Carol. We love you very much. And yeah, we want to just take this weekend to honor you because your marriage has been an encouragement and a blessing to many, um, including Daniel and I. Um, Tom and Carol, they did our premarital. Um, so we met with them for six months and they taught us a lot. Uh, but not only that, we've looked at their marriage and we've modeled our own marriage after theirs. And they've been in a huge blessing to us in our own life. Um, but also just even in ministry, knowing that we could go to them and we could count on them to always be there for us and to cheer us on. Um, so we're just grateful for you, for you pouring into us, but also for them pouring into our church. So we just wanted to honor them. So thank you. We have a little gift here for you to enjoy a nice dinner out. We're grateful for you. Thank you, Daniel and Natalie. Good morning. It's, it's good to be here with you today, and it's been great over the past 50 years to uh, walk with you and to share with you, and uh, if we poured into anyone's life, that's all because of God, and we're thankful to be able to do it. Who would have known 50 years ago, in our last month at UCR, Carol and I would meet each other. She was dating one of my buddies on the baseball team, and I swooped in and took her away. <laughs> <laughs> and we fell in love and got married soon after that. Uh, and we started coming to the Grove. Uh, right, right away, we've been here our whole married life, 50 years uh, here at the Grove. And I can tell you, I think one of the reasons that we have a great marriage is because we've watched so many of you over the years. You have encouraged us. We've watched your marriage. We emulate so many of you in your marriages, and God has blessed us uh, with that time. And we're so thankful that we've been here all these years at the Grove to grow and to watch you and to be a part of your lives and as you've been a part of our lives in a very special way. Uh, so much so in the last six or seven months when Carol went through her uh, surgery for cancer and her chemotherapy, you showed love to us like uh, it's been, it was wonderful. And I just want to thank you for that and being a part of our life and the good times and the difficult times. God's always good, and uh, you've always been faithful. An announcement that uh, Daniel's been one of my great encouragers. He's always asking me, you need to preach, you need to preach. I can't preach anymore. Uh, my, my voice just won't do it. I can go five or ten minutes and it's done and... Uh, my specialist who's worked on my throat, she told me, it's your fault. You breathe wrong. She says, you're supposed to breathe from your diaphragm. You don't. You breathe from your chest up, and it's not the right way to breathe. And during all those years when I was coaching and teaching here at the Grove, uh, the muscles around my vocal cords got bigger so it could project my voice. 
but it also kept on growing, the muscles did, and now they choke my vocal cords, and uh, I, just, I just can't go uh, at a long period anymore. Please don't feel sorry for me. I've had the great blessing of, of teaching and preaching for almost 50 years at the Grove, and so I'm just thankful what God has done. So thank you. There's a, there's a lot of things. Carol and I still, we're still working on staff. We, we enjoy our time. We're in our best stage ever. So don't, don't feel sorry for us. This is a gravy train right now. It's really good. And so I love working for Daniel and Natalie. It's great. And the team. And so we'll always be here encouraging the pastors and doing whatever we can to support. But anyway, thank you for all your love for us. God bless. Yeah. I haven't said this in the other services, but it is kind of a cool thing to say. Like, my muscles are so strong <laughs> in my voice, I can't do it. <laughs> it's my muscles. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's actually been a really hard even thing for me. I mean, like many of you, we've sat under Tom's teaching for, for years uh, since, since I was young. And uh, I remember the last time uh, Tom preached in during the love offering. He said, Daniel, this may be my last time. And it was hard. It was hard. I've been, like, mourning it. I went to all four services uh, or, or three services during that, that weekend just because I wanted to hear every single one. Um, I still want to find areas for him to teach, maybe in, in times where we can have him preach one time in men's or something like that. I, I just, I've been so blessed by his teaching and his faithfulness, and we wanted to honor him uh, today, but not just honor him, honor him and Carol, 50 years of marriage and serving this church. So God bless you both. You, you bless us in so many ways. So let me... Uh, let us thank the Lord for, for them and uh, pray for Pastor Damon as he comes up and shares. God, that we come before you and we do give you praise. Thank you so much for uh, Tom and Carol, just their love for each other, their love for you, their love for our church. Uh, bless them today and remind them of how much we love them, how much you love them. God, also just be with Damon as he comes and shares your word. I'm thankful for him, his love for you. And as he shares today, may your Holy Spirit speak to each one of us in a powerful way that draws our hearts to you. We pray this in your name. Amen. As we go down and, and, and Damon comes up, why don't we stand and greet one another and welcome those around us. Good morning, Grove family. Good morning. For those of us who are here in the sanctuary, if you're watching online or in the courtyard, I would love to invite you to turn with me to Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 16. As we continue our journey through the book of Philippians, we begin a new series simply titled Press On. And our passage today is going to unpack the depth of that phrase, press on. But it's also connected to the title of the sermon, which is The One Thing. Paul in this text is going to share with us the one thing that he has learned to develop, mature, and use on a day-to-day -day basis that fuels his ability to continue to press on. Last weekend, uh, as we celebrated the resurrection of Christ, I also celebrated a personal milestone. It was on March 31st of 1996 when the Lord called me out of darkness into light at the age of 15. And so it was my 28th spiritual birthday. And the reason that that is something very uh, important to communicate as it relates to this text is because from Paul's conversion that we read about in the book of Acts until the time that he wrote this particular epistle to the saints in the city of Philippi, scholars say that it would have been between 26 to 28 years that the time that he had been walking with Jesus. So what I am not saying is that I am at the same level of Paul. But what I am saying is the longer that I follow the Lord, the more I realize of my own flesh and my own sin, the more I realize I've never arrived at that place where I can just chill and coast. What I recognize is that I desire Jesus more today than I did when I was 15. And the reality of that is because God has been gracious and faithful to me throughout this marathon in this race of the Christian life. And through every up and down, every change, every challenge, every sin that I've committed, and every time that God has used me, 
It has all collectively allowed me to grow in the depth of my love and mature for him and for others. And so with that, I think a good summary for this particular passage is our main point. And it's simply this. The Christian life is not a sprint. It's a marathon. So when you're tempted to quit, remind yourself to press on. And this truth is really the summary of where we're going to go today. And here at The Grove, we love to take notes, so I want to introduce you to our first point. The first point for today, and each of these points are going to give you tangible reasons why you should press on. The first point in verse 12 is simply press on because you're, you are Jesus' prized possession. And in verse 12, there are four encouraging truths that Paul shares with us that I want us to really work through together to gain an understanding of what it means for those who are in Christ to truly be the prized possession of our Savior. Verse 12 starts off saying, Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. So Paul opens up saying, Not that I have already obtained this, that Literal statement makes my mind wonder, what is he talking about? What has he not obtained? The Greek verb for that word that we translate obtained into English means to not just grasp or hold something, but literally to have ownership. It is your possession, but it literally is in your possession. So you hold what you own. And so what he's saying is he does not hold something. He does not own it fully yet in his hand and what he's grasping. And to understand what is it that he's talking about, we have to go back to where Pastor Daniel had walked us through last weekend. And let's look at verses 10 and 11 that precede verse 12. Paul writes and he says, That I may know him and the power of his resurrection, and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. So what Paul is saying What he has not yet obtained and grasped a hold of is being resurrected. His life is not done. So he could not obtain resurrection from the dead because he was still alive physically while he was penning this letter. But those two verses, 10 and 11, actually for us chart out the course of the Christian marathon that Jesus literally paved himself. So I want to show literally that course to us in those two verses, and then we will continue on in unpacking verse 12. But the first thing that Paul says in verse 10 is that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. That is the moment that the marathon begins. Paul knew the power of Christ, and he knew the power of the resurrection And he was first introduced to this power the moment that he turned from his sins and by faith embraced Christ as his Savior. Because Paul is the same one that would tell us in Romans chapter 8 verse 11 that it was through the power of God the Holy Spirit that Christ raised from the dead and walked out victoriously over death, hell, and the grave that resurrection morning. And so Paul knew that he had already encountered this resurrection power. But what's beautiful is that Paul was like, I'm not content with just this encounter. Paul wanted this to be something that he grew in a depth of understanding. That's why even celebrating Tom and Carol's 50th anniversary is something that we should celebrate. And all of those who were married or those who were praying to be married or those who may be on their second marriage or other marriages, what we know about this reality is that that union of one man and one woman, no matter what has happened in the past, that when we are in Christ, this togetherness fostered allows us to walk together where we should, if Christ is our first love and our first pursuit, we grow in a maturing of our love for our spouse. It doesn't mean that everything is easy. It doesn't mean that everything is all good all the time. As Alicia and I are working on year number 21, I probably irritate her today in as much as I did when we first got married. I have frustrated her on numerous occasions. Low-key, she done the same thing for me, but we still make it work. (laughs) Why? Because Christ is the center of our affection. 
And he loves us with an unconditional love. And he deposited that into us the moment that my wife and I embraced Christ before we were even married. And so even as we go through the ups and downs, we look to the different marriages that are modeled here. The blended families that are here, we learn from each other's story. We spur each other on. No matter what had taken place in our past, we are presently here together. And if we all collectively in the Grow family keep Christ as our main focus, then that will now allow us to grow in a greater depth of what the power of the resurrection literally does in and through us day by day. So that we can say like Paul, that I may know him and continue to know him more intimately in the power of his resurrection. Because like Paul, when we embrace Christ and we heard that we were sinners who could not save ourselves with any work that we would ever do in our lives and that we did not deserve to be saved at all because we deserve the justice of God, which is his wrath for all of our sins. The moment that we heard that Christ lived the perfect life that none of us could live, that Christ stood in our place as a substitute to receive the full cup of God's wrath on the cross, that Christ shed his blood so that he could purchase us away from sin's slavery and his resurrection power power would demonstrate that he did everything that God required to save us. When we heard that story and we believed it and we confessed with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and God raised him from a dead in an instant, we who were only physically alive but spiritually dead were first given the power of the resurrection by becoming a new creation through the ministry of God the Holy Spirit. We received the resurrection power that resurrected Directed us from a state of spiritual death to now having life that is everlasting. And simultaneously with that, we were also baptized, fully immersed into the global church with every other follower of Christ who has lived over the last three millennia that heard the same gospel, turned by faith to repent and embrace Christ. That's why for every soul that is celebrating the beautiful ordinance of baptism today, that is but a physical and visible representation of a legitimate spiritual reality that has already taken place. And the beauty of baptism reminds us that as we go underwater, we are buried with Christ. And as we come out of the water, we are resurrected with him as well. But the Holy Spirit doesn't stop there. Because now that we have been born again, baptized, he also now abides in us permanently. He lives inside of us. So the resurrection power literally is within every follower of Christ. And the marathon began all in that moment. And we were equipped with every tool and every spiritual blessing we would need that would carry us through the remainder of the marathon, which Paul says, and I may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in death. So on this course of the marathon... Every breath that we breathe as a follower of Christ until we exhale our final breath in this life, the marathon continues. It will be a time filled with ups and downs, highs and lows, mids for most of it. But the reality of that also helps us understand that with every moment of suffering, every joy of success, every season of flourishing, and every time that we endure through a season of famine, we are learning a greater appreciation and more depth for the power of the resurrection. And at the same time, we are participating and sharing in the sufferings of Christ until we die. And that's when the marathon ends. And that's why Paul says that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Jesus paved the path of the marathon that Paul was on. And it's the same pathway that we, along with every church mother and father over the last three millennia, have faithfully followed in crossing the finish line before us. And what is so encouraging about that is what Paul says next. That after nearly running this race for nearly 30 years, he says that he is not already perfect. 
He still struggles with sin. He still falls into sin. He's still learning to confess his sins to Christ every single day. And in my life, I echo that now so more than any other season in life before. I remember talking to my mom about my frustration in my first few years of walking with Jesus, tempted by the streets, tempted by all these things that I was once doing and conditioned to do. And she said, mijo, the reason that you keep seeing more of your sinfulness is not to discourage you, but it's because you're coming out of the darkness and approaching in the light. And when you're in the light, you see more of the stains of your former way of life. And Christ is telling you these are opportunities to wash up, to get cleaned up, and to keep moving forward. A non-believer does not struggle with sin. They're enslaved to it. But a Christian, we struggle. We fall. That's why we must confess, receive the forgiveness, get up, and keep moving forward. After all these years, Paul just wanted to be close to Jesus. But I think what he's communicating is the tension that every Christian feels in this life. We are not who we used to be because we used to be spiritually dead. We will never go back to that state because the gift of eternal life is just that. It's eternal. There is no expiration date on eternal life. So we will never go back to who we used to be. But at the same time, we are not who we are going to be when we are the completed product of Jesus' work. Because earlier in this same letter, Paul says in chapter 1, verse 6, that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Jesus sees us as the finished product that he is making us to be. And you and I, we don't see ourselves that way right now because we are still in the process of the marathon. Do we sin? Yes. Are we perfect? No. But are we growing in our maturity for our love for God and our love for others? We should be. If We cooperate with the Holy Spirit. So how do we do that? Exactly what Paul says. But I press on to make it my own. That phrase press on literally means to keep moving forward. To complete a task. To reach a goal. Or in this case, in the space of athletics, which the city of Philippi was very familiar with. The Olympic Games that we're going to prayerfully see this summer. This was the origin of it in this particular region of the world. So these Saints understood the reality of athletics, struggle, competition, and reward. And what he is saying is, I press on. I move forward to the finish line. Despite my sin, despite my past, despite my present struggles, despite the fact I don't see myself as the finished product that Christ already sees me as, I press on. That phrase to press on literally is something that I don't think that we really have to struggle to understand. Because if we think about our hustle, our motivation, and our drive, before we knew Jesus, and even while we've been in Christ, to get what our flesh wants, we would move heaven and earth no matter what obstacle was thrown in our way. We would finagle through life and navigate to get whatever it is that we wanted to get when it came to sin. So you and I, we don't struggle with knowing what press on really means. It's about redirecting our hustle away from human pursuits to pursuing holiness. So that same energy that we once invested into pursuing the things of the flesh and the things of sin, redirect it. Because that same energy is still here, but redirect it away from sin and towards holiness. We've got to apply that in the hustle of our faith. And this is where it makes the difference. you got to look at what are you hustling for? What are you motivated to achieve? If it's not Christ, then you need to redirect it away from whatever idol it is that you're pursuing, even as a follower of Christ. Paul says this, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. The fourth and final encouraging statement from verse 12 is that what I just read. Paul recognized that he was already Christ's. We belong to Jesus. We are his prized possession. See, Paul actually used some wordplay. Because the first time that he used this verb, obtained, it was in a negative sense. Because he had not grasped. The resurrection is not in his possession. 
But in this, it's the positive. Jesus already has not just grasped, but he holds you as his own, near and dear to him. And you, no demon in hell, no person from your past or in your per, per, present situation, they cannot pluck you out of the hand of the one that bought you. This beautiful truth is echoed in the words of Isaiah chapter 53, verses 11 and 12. Because it describes Jesus on the cross when he shed his blood as the only form of payment that God accepts to remove the debt of our sinfulness. Not his because he never sinned. And the resurrection is just like a financial transaction. Whenever we go to a store and we line up all the things on the conveyor belt and they bag it and then they tell us what the sum total is and we tap our debit card and that word approved pops up, what it's saying is, in my case, thank God my wife balances the checkbook, we got enough to cover the expenses. And so with that, these items that were once in possession of this company, of this organization, I now leave with them as my possessions no longer to the company that they once belonged to. And the power and the evidence and the proof is that receipt that comes out the cash register that shows every single itemized purchase that the full payment was made, a zero balance is the result, and I take those goods to use them as my own because they are my own. But when we think about the words of Isaiah 53, 11, and 12, that's exactly what it's communicating. Jesus was numbered amongst transgressions. His perfect life with that in his body, he held that on the cross in a matter of hours to receive the full justice of God. There's something we could not pay off throughout all of eternity. And he surrendered and volunteered his life, and he gave it, which is the penalty of sin, death. He volunteered to die because he never sinned. No one can take his life. And his resurrection is when God told everyone in the human race, approved. The shed blood, the perfect life, he's take the death sentence. It's all been done away with. It is approved. And instead of just a receipt out of the cash register, later in Scripture in the book of Revelation, we are introduced to the Lamb's book of life, which is an itemization of every soul that Christ saves. So the power is in the receipt. The power is connected to the resurrection. And the power that resides in us is what keeps us pressing on because we are the possession of Jesus. You don't belong to the old clique you used to run with. You don't belong to the old you that you used to be. You don't belong to a political party. You don't belong to what people call you. You don't belong to the categories they throw at you because they don't want you following Christ. You belong to Jesus and you are his prized possession. And Paul understood this. That's what kept him pressing on. So our second point is that we should press on because Jesus is your prize. I want to highlight this by talking about the race of the century that took place in 1954. John Landy and Roger Bannister were the first two human beings to ever run the mile in under four minutes. And they had broke that record within weeks of one another, and they were going to go head-to-head in a race that summer. And I mean, this race lived up to its height. John Landy started off strong, and he had at least a five-foot lead in front of Bannister, and they both had left everybody in the dust. So as they were approaching the finish line, the final turn, in the last nine seconds of this race, John Landy did something that every good disciplined runner knows not to do, but also every child that has an elementary introductory level to any sport that involves running, you don't look back. And what Landy did in his pace of trying to cross the finish line first to be the fastest man in the world, looks back to his left, doesn't see Bannister, and looks to the front once again. But what he didn't see is that Bannister, while he was giving his last burst of energy, known as his kick, he was actually passing Landy on the right. And Landy never saw him, and the next time he would see him was only to the back as he crossed the finish line. Now, Landy still got the silver medal. That ain't bad. But that's not the issue. The issue is looking back prevents us from finishing strong. And that's exactly what the evil one wants for every single one of us in Christ. He's lost us. He can never steal us away from Christ. But the greatest thing he can do, 
keep you from finishing strong. Destroy your testimony and your witness. So what Paul says is, here's the one thing. Here's the one thing that prevented him and equally prevents every other follower in Christ from not finishing strong. He says, brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. But let me tell you what this idea of forgetting what lies behind doesn't mean. First, before we unpack what it does mean. Forgetting what lies behind does not mean that the memories of all of our lived experiences when we were not following Christ automatically disappear the moment we get saved. That does not happen. We live with those memories. We live with regrets. We live with the lessons that prayerfully prayerfully we learn from the mistakes and the sinful choices that we made in the past, but they don't go away when we embrace Christ. But at the same time, we also have to understand that forgetting what lies behind does not mean that the consequences from even our sinful and fleshly decisions while we've been in Christ running this marathon, that they don't vanish away simply because we keep pressing on. There are consequences that we still have to endure. So we must never get it twisted that we are not forgiven for all of our sins simply because we still got to deal with the consequences. The consequences remain, but only in this life. It's not until we cross the finish line that they will finally be something that we do not interact with. So what does it mean to forget what is behind? That phrase literally means to put something out of your mind. It's there. We can't act like it's not. And there are times that we may see people, we may hear things, we may smell smells, there are tastes that may trigger us to remember something in our past. Sometimes it's all good, sometimes it's all sinful, but we got to deal with these triggers. But even pressing into what does that mean to put it out of our minds, it literally means don't let our past actions distract us from looking ahead at our prize, who is Jesus. And there's two disciplines that each of us in Christ must learn to practice until we see him face to face. Number one, don't dwell on the details of your sinful choices before you met Christ. Especially when you hit a season of hardship or suffering, especially when you feel like God is silent and not answering your prayers in the way that you want them to be answered. Because it's in those moments that I can say in my life that I'm tempted to go back to what once worked in a former way of life that should not be a part of my life in Christ now. But I'm human. And I've got those experiences. And I think, well, it worked then. It can work now. God's taken too long. He must have forgotten about me. No, that's not the case. But I often look at Scripture. What biblical realities do we have to help us understand why forgetting our sinful choices in the details is something we shouldn't dwell on? Well, think about Israel. When Israel was brought out of slavery in Egypt and they were wandering in the wilderness, they were grumbling against the provisions that God gave. God was meeting their needs every moment of every day. And he didn't give them their wants. And that's what they complained about. And they were over there talking about some, hey, man, I, man, I missed the garlic, bruh. I missed the onions. I missed the meat. I like to believe they missed the tapatio as well. And it's like, man, we had all that in Egypt. And somebody was like, time out. Y'all tripping. Y'all, we were slaves. They whooped us. They beat us. They never paid us for our work. We didn't, we didn't have a severance package. Oh, yeah, here you go. Here, no, we didn't have that. Like, what are you talking about? All you're thinking about is what you want. Your needs are met, but what you want is not what you have. You want to go back to slavery? That's what you want to go back to, to get what you want? And we, we shouldn't even be mad at Israel. Because I think about Proverbs 26, 11 that says, a dog returns to its own vomit. Now, I never knew what that passage really meant because I've never been a dog lover. That's why I was laughing last week when Pastor Daniel was talking about he ain't a dog lover. I'm like, bro, I'm with solidarity on that, homie. I'm with you, bro. Because where I grew up, I have a lot of traumatic experiences with dogs. They ran in gangs. They was in the hood. They was hard. I got jumped a couple times by some Rottweilers, and I'm not playing. That's that's real. I don't like dogs. We got this mutual understanding. I don't like them. They don't like me. It is what it is. But when my kids and my wife are like, let's get a dog, I'm like, man, y'all tripping. I ain't got time for that. Like, nah. And eventually I was outvoted, and we got a dog. 
And I said, okay, here's the compromise. The dog that we get can be the size of a chihuahua, and that's it. <laughs> so we got a little chihuahua. <laughs> Mixed with terrier, and the little homie name is Ace Batman Horton. <laughs> One day I came home from work early. Alicia was still here at work, kids at school, where they should be. And I get home, and Ace is right there looking at me all shaking when I walk in. I'm like, bro, what's wrong with you? <laughs> well, I look down next to him, and he regurgitated something. He vomited something. And I'm like, ugh, bro, you was eating a carpet? What is that? Like, I didn't know what it was. But my wife has taught me well. She's patient because I didn't grow up with dogs. She did. And I was like, well, what do I got to do? She told me where all the sprays and everything was. So I got all these, you know, items walking in. And I look back at Ace, and that boy looking at me shaking even harder now. And I'm like, bruh. And I look, and whatever he threw up, it's gone. <laughs> and I was like, uh, you little cochino, what's wrong with you eating that? And literally in that moment, a dog does return to its vomit. But as we think about Israel, think about the struggle of my boy Ace, and I still don't understand. When we bring it to our own experiences, it may not be literal vomit. But you know what? It's that person that you want to get back in your life that shouldn't be in your life. It's the scrolling to see how they're doing. It's intersecting yourself where they'll see you to see if something could be sparked again. It's going back to what you were once comfortable with that Christ had called you out of. It's looking to put yourself under whatever had enslaved you before Christ. So what he is saying is here, don't look back and dwell on the details to the point that it distracts you from walking and pursuing Christ with all you got, especially when life gets hard. My wife put me up on this quote from the head coach of Duke women's basketball team, Kara Lawson. And there was a clip of her encouraging the women on her team where she is telling them life is only going to get harder. It's not going to get easier. It was easy when you were a child, but it's never going to get to the point of ease that it once was. It's only going to get harder, only going to get more difficult. So what you have to do, and she said something so amazing, you've got to handle hard better. You've got to handle the hardships better than you did before because now you have the knowledge, the tools, the capacity, the people in your life that will spur you on to get you to now handle hard better instead of thinking, should I go back to Egypt? But the second way that we have to practice discipline and forgetting what is behind us is not looking at the highlights that we did for Christ earlier in our walk with Christ so that we can justify being lazy for the rest of our life in Christ in this life. Because many Christians start off strong. They set a pace, but the hardships come, and they keep coming, and the sufferings, and the challenges and pretty soon they think, well, I did all this back then. I'm just going to go on autopilot and cruise control and just coast my way into the presence of God. Brothers and sisters, there is nothing in the Bible that says that's what we do in the sunset years of our life or in the sunset years of walking with Jesus. I think about the first time that I was privileged to be a senior pastor in a church. I literally got the call on my 27th birthday. And the 13 members that were in this church were between the ages of 56 and 92. And when Alicia and I walked in that first Sunday, we were the youth group in this church. <laughs> and over the course of time, the Lord began to add to our numbers people that were younger than 56. And so every Wednesday, we would have like a missions emphasis for Bible study. And one Sunday, I said, you know what, this coming Wednesday... We're going to bring a little bit of uh, a local perspective to global missions because I would begin to tell the church that missions is across the sea, but it's also across the street. And so I said, so what we're going to do is we're going to go door to door and we're just going to ask our neighbors immediately in this neighborhood how we can pray for them. And we're going to keep doing this to build a missional presence in the community. And God bless the seasoned saints in this church I'll never forget. They walked up to me, and they was like, uh, Pastor, baby, we love you, but uh, you know half of us on walkers and the other half of us on oxygen. What you really think we're going to do out there? 
And then somebody, I don't know who in the back, was like, we did that in the 60s, right? And I'm like, okay, okay. And then another brother who was the only, uh, like, elder, if you will, uh, said, yeah, you know, that's how our family came to this church in 1948. They knocked on our door, asked us to pray, and they said, hey, why don't you come to church? And I said, praise be to God. I said, praise his name. Y'all was doing it in the 40s, you were doing it in the 60s, I assume in the 50s. But even if we ain't done it for three or four decades, guess what? What an amazing ministry to resurrect today. And I said, but here's the thing. I ain't asking y'all to go out in the midst of the humidity on oxygen and in walkers. I said, but here's what I want you to do. Because we need you. And you play an equal role in this ministry effort. I need you just to show up on Wednesday. That's all I need you to do. And I want you to lay hands on us and commission us out and pray us out. Pray for us while we're out. And when we come back, pray with us over all the prayer requests. If y'all can do that, there is an equal partnership in ministry. And you know what? They did. And I think about that and I say, that's God's design. He even told Israel in the Old Testament when it came to their physical survival with food in the promised land. He said, you get an older ox with a younger ox. You put them in a yoke and you plow. Why? You get two young oxen with all that strength, vitality, and bullheadedness, they will not cooperate together. They'll zigzag and try to fight each other, and you won't be able to plow a straight line. But if you get two seasoned and older oxen, the weight of that yoke is going to prevent them from moving at a pace. It'll be a straight plow, but it won't be at a pace that will allow the people to harvest enough food to eat and survive. So God said... Bring a younger and an older together in the yoke so that the strength, the vitality, the zeal, the let's get out there and make it happen of the youth will be connected with the wisdom, the precision, and the guidance of direction from the older. And they would plow a straight line so that crops could be yielded and the people would survive. Whether you served in ministry years ago and you haven't done anything in decades, this is not a message of condemnation. It's a message of saying, we need you and we want you. And your participation now, though it may look different than seasons in the past, it doesn't matter. It's still participation. So if there's physical ailments, if there's challenges that you're facing, and it's not just for those who are older in years, it could be younger and you have an autoimmune disease. It doesn't matter. Please think holistically about all the gifts and talents that God has collected in all of the Grove family, we each play an essential role and at the bare minimum. The type of ministry that we are in dire need of is the beautiful ministry of prayer warriors who are going to war in the heavenlies, empowered by the Holy Spirit, full of the knowledge of the Word of God, proclaiming God's Word over every leader, over every member, and every potential person out in our communities that need to hear Christ from members in the grove. We need intercessory prayer warriors. There is no disease on earth that will stop you from that. There is no ailment. There is no situation from stopping you from praying for us because we need it and we need someone to model for us what it looks like when we have to say, I can't do it anymore. And we don't need them to feel bad because I'm not going to lie. When Pastor Daniel shared with me about Pastor Tom, And I've been blessed to sit under his ministry as pastor emeritus for the going on four years now. I tried my hardest not to cry when Pastor Daniel told me. But low key, when I walked away into this little back room, I wept and I cried. And I said, he's not done. I know he's not done. But this is a closing of a chapter, God. And I haven't even experienced the fullness of it. I just got the latter part of it. But I was like, man, we are so blessed. Because it's not because of a scandal. It's not because of a a secret sin that, that he's being. No, it's I can't do it anymore. Now what he said to us is don't feel sorry. He needs other people to get in and to continue to move forward. And he and Carol are not dead. They're showing us what it looks like to start a new season, a new chapter in life, even with 50 years of marriage. We have no excuse to say I'm tapping out, I'm done. Because there was a difference between tactfully reflecting on the past and trying to recreate it. 
when we tactfully reflect, we remember the good and the bad and the ugly. And we impart the wisdom and the lessons that are learned to the next generation. But to recreate means we're trying to force everyone to go back to a lived experience that is impossible to recreate. And I praise God that's not the rhythm of what's going on here. It's about working together, remember the past, learn, and let us now press on. I think of this quote from a man by the name of Andy Bernard on the show The Office. I know it's not a heavyweight theologian, but there is a nugget of truth in what he said in this show. He said, I wish there was a way to know you're in the good old days before you've actually left them. Brothers and sisters, here's what I want you to understand. The good old days of back then are the good old days. But the good old days of tomorrow are right now. Realize we're in this moment together. That the sovereign Lord of the universe planned the time that we would be born, the places that we would live, all of our lives and all different points that we've all interacted with. And every step that we've taken on planet earth, we are now here in this moment. Christ is calling us, press on, maximize this moment. Because today will be the good old days of tomorrow, but we've got to model for the younger ones coming after us what it looks like to transition full of health and vitality and intergenerational connectedness to keep pressing on. This is why Paul says we can do it, because he did it. He said, I press on to the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. Paul knew that his prize in the upward call was being resurrected because at that moment, he would finally embrace Jesus. And Paul loves us enough to say, he's not the only one that will receive his prize. We will. We will receive Jesus. And there is no suffering, no sinful consequence that will ever separate us from him. We will be in his presence and we will continue to learn more about our God. But we won't have to deal with the foolishness of sin that we struggled with for so long in this life. There is no retirement in the body of Christ. In fact, Paul would go on two years after writing this letter to the saints in Philippi. This is what he says to his son Timothy. He says, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering. And at the time my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I've finished the race, I've kept the faith. Henceforth there was laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only me, but also to all who loved his appearing. Paul knew Jesus was the prize. Jesus is your prize. Keep your eyes on Jesus. i got to tell myself, Damon, keep your eyes on Jesus. He is the prize. Scripture gives us hope that when you face hardships and you face sufferings, I don't want to minimize it because some of us are going through some real hard times that we don't know a way out of. We don't see a way out of. But let me tell you why Scripture is so important, that we shouldn't divorce reading Scripture when we go through hard times. Because let me tell you something beautiful about the Word of God. The Word of God does not airbrush the people of God to remove all the blemishes of their lives away from them. No, we should feel humanly in company with those that finished their race because of the sinful mistakes they made because it may be some of the mistakes that we've made and if they finished we finished and if you don't know where to look Hebrews chapter 11 Hebrews chapter 11 is the hall of faith let me just give you this quick list before we get to our final point Noah we're familiar with him soon as his brother stepped off the ark planted a vineyard got drunk and we're dealing with the consequences of that even to this day but he still finished his race Sarah, she laughed at God when he said, I'm going to give you a child, and her womb was barren. She was in the retirement age of her life, and she laughed at God because she didn't believe him, but she still finished her race. Moses, this brother had an anger issue, anger problems, and he murdered someone. He wasn't perfect, but he finished his race. Rahab was a prostitute, but guess what? It's not held against her. She's in the lineage of our Savior, literally, in those generations that our Savior would be born through. You can't tell me that your past defines where you are when you come to Christ because there are prostitutes that are in the lineage of our Savior, and that's by God's design. She finished her race. 
Gideon doubted God. He was a coward. Even when the angel of the Lord said, mighty man of valor, that brother was like, who are you talking to, dog? It's just me. He had no backbone, but he finished his race. David, adulterer, non-present father figure. He was a horrible dad. An adulterer, a conspirator. Like conspired to murder. He was a murderer, but he finished his race. Samson, problems with lust, gave himself to prostitutes, gave the covenant away that Yahweh had given to him, fell into lust, suffered dire consequences physically for it, but he's in the hall of faith. He finished his race. Each of us have a past. All of us do. But the beauty of that past is that it echoes truth that God can snatch anybody from anywhere out of the depth of any sin that they are enslaved to, redeem them, wash them, and set them apart so that they can be an example for others who are still enslaved slaved in that same sin. That's why our past is not something that we have to think that defines us, but it's part of our story. And that story shows the power of God that if he can save us, Who dare in their right mind say that they are beyond salvation? So the final reason we press on, because practice makes perfect. In the last two verses, Paul closes with this as I do. He says, let those of us who are mature think this way. And if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal that also to you. Only let us hold true to what we have attained. Paul is using sarcasm here. I want us to be very, uh, understand, it's brother being sarcastic right now. Because there were people in Philippi that were saying that they were spiritually superior than other people, including Paul. That they were perfect and that they had attained what Paul had not attained yet. They didn't see the foolishness of their own claim. That they are perfect and attained the resurrection, but they're still alive and they hadn't died yet. So what Paul says, you know what, I'm going to make an appeal, yoke. Follow Christ as I follow him. Don't think you're superior than any other Christian. Keep on following Christ. And if you disagree and still swear that you are perfect and superior, you know what? This is probably one of the most mature moves Paul ever communicates. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit deal with you because you ain't hearing it from me. And sometimes in our walk with Jesus, when we are stubborn and we don't want to hear, and when we encounter someone like that as well, it's best to just trust them to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Let God reveal those things to them. At the same time, that should not prevent us from keep pressing forward and practicing the presence of the Holy Spirit who lives inside of us. That phrase, practice makes perfect, in the space of athletics literally doesn't mean that you are going to compete perfectly every time. It's really talking about work ethic, that if you work hard, you'll get good results. If you put half heartedness into it, you're not going to get good results. So you get out what you put in. I was talking with Coach K earlier this morning, and he agrees. He was like, Damon, I understand. I don't like that phrase either. He said, that's why I tell my athletes, practice makes permanent. And I said, oh, you preaching now, Coach? Because if you think about that, practice makes permanent. The Spirit of God lives permanently inside of us. We are permanently a possession of God through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, through everything Christ did. And at the same time, Jesus is our permanent prize. So practice makes permanent. So what does that mean? Every day we show up to cooperate with God, the Holy Spirit. And we have a work ethic to put to death the misdeeds of our flesh. But Romans 8 reminds us it's the Spirit of the living God inside of us that gives us the ability, the strength, and the endurance to do it day after day after day after day until we cross the finish line. The last quote I want to share is from a young man who loved basketball his whole life. He tried out for the team and he was too short. No pun intended. He didn't make the cut, but he kept working and the Lord blessed him with growing a few inches over the course of the summer. He was able to try out, made the team. But he kept working, staying after practice to the point that he became a leader on the team and led them to success. To the point that he then got a reward. A full paid scholarship to a D1 university playing basketball for the team that he dreamed to play for. And he didn't start off as a leader. He started at the very bottom. But he was the last one out of the gym. He stayed for hours after. He worked and worked and worked. In fact, all of his coaches that ever coached him said that this person's work ethic is unparalleled 
unmatched. And one time when someone asked this individual about their work ethic, here's what he said. I don't do things half-heartedly because I know if I do, then I can expect half-hearted results. The man who said this is who I personally will vet for as the greatest of all time in basketball, Michael Jordan. He showed that what you put in is what you get out. But you know what's the irony of this? He's the greatest that ever played the game in my mind, and that's a game that he can't play anymore. Every season is in the past. But what about us? We should surpass Michael Jordan's work ethic for basketball each and every day, putting the time in that is necessary to be with God, read his word, pray, spend time with the people of God so that God will show himself to be true. Because in Hebrews he says he rewards those who diligently seek him. Your reward is not just when you embrace Christ, but he gives us daily rewards by fellowship with him, his word, and each other. So no matter what you're facing, remember the Christian life is not a sprint. It's a marathon. So when you're tempted to quit, remind yourself to press on. Press on because you are Jesus' prized possession. Press on because Jesus is your prize. And press on because practice, it makes permanent. And you will permanently be with Jesus. Let's pray. Father, for those of us who are here or watching online that have never embraced you as Savior and Lord, I pray that, Father, you would draw them to Christ. The gospel has been proclaimed. And I pray that they would now be drawn to you jealously, that they would pursue you and no longer the idols that they have sought to love their whole lives that will never love them back, especially in the way that you love them. And for every single one of us who are in Christ in this marathon, who are weary, who are tired, who are ready to quit, who doesn't know what tomorrow is going to bring, Father, give them the endurance they need to press on. Even if that means coming up for prayer and our prayer partners, guide and direct us as we reflect on these truths and sing truth to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, will you please stand with us as we sing this last song?
church. Praise God. Thank you so much for lifting up your voices and worshiping with us today. A few announcements before you go. If you're new to the Grove family, we'd love to get to know some more about you. You can go right over there to guest center at your right. If you'd like prayer, come down to the front. We have praying partners for you. If you have a desire to give, there's giving baskets by the door. And it is, again, Baptismal Sunday. There is baptisms happening now in the courtyard. Please go check it out. Have a great rest of your Sunday. God bless you all.